You know, I've thought a lot about how it is that so many of us became chronically disengaged from the issues of politics. And part of it is not just that it's so toxic, but also that our politics seems so far removed from our human realities. And that's very unfortunate because the effect of public policy uh, is very, very great. The influence is very great on the actual human experiences that people have, and not always uh, in a good way. There's a lot of suffering that goes on on this planet because of public policy. And right now what we're talking about is specifically American public policy, and that is both domestic and international. What I want to talk to you about right now is economics. You know, when I was growing up and um, as a young woman, I sort of thought of economics as something, oh, Marianne, you're not about that. You don't know anything about economics or anything like that. And it's very much a topic where we have this kind of myth of the experts. You have to be an economist to understand those things, dear. And I think women feel that. Um, often, particularly, this kind of little pat on the head. You don't worry about that, uh, you pretty little thing. Uh, the economists are going to handle that. And then when I was reading a book uh, about Gandhi and about Gandhian principles of nonviolence, there's a line that Gandhi said, and it completely opened my mind in such a way. He said, the idea that economics is a verifiable science is one of the greatest evils ever foisted upon the human mind. And I went, what? It's not? It's not some science that I don't understand? No, it's not some science you don't understand. There are just theories. And so you want to look at the state of the world. And look, just in the United States alone, so you have 1% of the people who own more wealth than the bottom 90%. <clears throat> you have um, the greatest income inequality since 1929. You have 93 million people living near poverty. You have 40 million people uh, living uh, in poverty. And, and you ask yourself, well, what does that mean in human terms? What it means in human terms is that we have tens of millions of people in the United States who live every single day with the chronic economic tension and anxiety. Now, notice what's happened already. We're talking about two different universes. One, economic theory, and one, hello, human experience, the experience of humanity. That's what we want to realize. If, if politics as we know it doesn't include factoring into the human experience, that's not a reason to leave politics. That's a reason to say we're coming in and we're fixing this because this is not working. It is not working for humanity. So you have all these economic theories that has led to what I said about the 1% the owning more wealth than the bottom 90, but that human experience of the tension, the economic tension and anxiety of tens of millions of people who don't know how, what will happen if they get sick and don't know what's going to happen if their children get sick, uh, don't know how they're going to send their kids to college, don't know how they're going to get out from under these college loans. So you can, you can talk all you want to, Mr. Economist person, about your economic theories, but this is the human experience that whatever the economic theories are that brought us to this place, this is what it has wrought. So, you know, it, it, it's like this whole thing that I, I felt so strongly about uh, in my presidential campaign. Only the people who brought us into this ditch are qualified to lead us out of the ditch. Let me tell you what the qualification is for getting us out of the ditch at this point. And this is not just for our political leaders. This is for all of us to have some conscience, to say, whoa, 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 what is the human experience here? And if it's not working, to change it. Let's remember, in our Declaration of Independence, which is the mission statement <clears throat> for all Americans. It says not only that we're equal, not only that God gave us inalienable rights of life, of liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but that governments are instituted to secure those rights, and that if government is not doing that, not performing that function, that it is the right of the people to alter it or to abolish it. Now, let's, let's connect economics to the right to pursue happiness. In the richest country in the world, there's no reason for you to have 40% of our citizens unable to cover an unexpected $1,000 expenditure. That means something's wrong. That means something's very, very wrong. And given the fact that we're the richest country in the world, that means government's not doing its job because those people are not free to pursue happiness. When you have an eight-year-old, we have millions of Americans' uh, children who go to school in schools where they don't even have the adequate school supplies with which to teach a child to read. And if a child cannot learn to read by the age of eight, then the chances of high school graduation are drastically decreased and the chances of incarceration are increased. 
that child, the vast majority of them, are citizens of the United States. And even if they're not, the, the, the Declaration of Independence says God gave all men inalienable rights. What about their inalienable rights? Can a child who has not been taught to read, it, or is our government securing, that? that's the role of the government according to the Declaration of Independence, to secure those rights? Where's the right of that child to, to, to pursue happiness? So this is an economic problem. So you can't say, oh, I don't have anything to do with economics. What you can say is, wait, something's very wrong. This is the deal, and this is, could not be more important today. You have one way of looking at the world, and it's an economic perspective that says, well, you build your economy, and that will serve people. But there's another way of looking at things. It's the more progressive way of looking at things. But it's, it's extremely important, and there's a level of progressivism that isn't even progressivism versus uh, conservatism. It's just human. Because it says serve people, and that will, among other things, boost your economy. Because when people are happier, people can, 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 can soar. People are more abundant on every level. That's why we should have free health care. That's why we should have free, uh, or at least very, very affordable health care, obviously, universal access to health care. That, that whether it is free or whether it is something that is a sliding scale, whatever, that we know that every single person in America gets health care, that we know that every person can have free college tuition at state colleges and universities, that we remove these college loan debts. Why? Let's talk about why in economic terms. Well, you either have a zero-sum game or you have an infinitely abundant natural order. The zero-sum game says, well, you know, we don't have the money to pay for everybody's health care, and we don't have the money to go to pay for everybody to go to college, and we don't have the money for, to remove all those college loans. First of all, even on like just plain political level, notice how they've passed in 2017 a $2 trillion tax cut where 83 cents of every dollar goes to the very, very richest individuals and corporations. And it has been proven this thing will probably never pay for itself. And of course, the canard is, oh, we're giving all that money to the very, very rich because they're job creators and see all that money trickles down and lifts all boats. They've been saying that for 40 years. It's not lifting all boats. It, what it does is to leave millions and millions of people without even a life vest. It has caused a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class and from the lower classes, obviously, I hate that expression, the disadvantaged classes is what we should call them into the hands of a very few. And this last, this last big theft, I say it as a public theft from the public treasury, was in 2017. So this continues. This is the way our public policy works. Take the money and put it into the hands of a very few, causing all this human suffering. We need a massive infusion of economic hope and opportunity into the life of the average American. Now that brings up a topic which is hot today. And that's capitalism versus socialism. And the way we're talking about it is so childish. It's like we're having a high school level conversation. So I want to introduce into your thinking a far more sophisticated understanding of what all that means. First of all, when Bernie Sanders, for instance, talks about um, democratic socialism, he's not talking about Cuba. He's not talking about Venezuela. He's talking about the Scandinavian countries, countries in Europe which are socialist countries, but they're plenty democratic. And in some cases, their democracies are more protected, their democratic practices than ours are. And they are, have elements of capitalism, just like you and I. Hello, Americans, we have elements of socialism. What do you call the police department? What do you call the fire department? That, that's all we're talking about here. So the most evolved situation is one in which there are elements that would, could be deemed socialist, and there are elements that could be deemed capitalist. Now, some people today say capitalism is evil, capitalism is inherently unjust. I personally do not believe this. What I believe is that starting back in the 1980s, when it was uh, proffered to the American people, that all the corporation had to do was to serve the financial uh, benefit of its stockholders. With that, cap American capitalism was completely divorced from its ethical center. 
Adam Smith, the main original articulator of free market capitalism, said free market capitalism cannot exist outside an ethical center. Po economic policy should have a conscience. Public policy should have a conscience. It is by and for people. Without that lodestar, without that guiding light of what is doing right by people, that's what ethics is. That's what conscience is. So starting in the 80s, cap American capitalism became completely divorced from any sense of, eth of ethical responsibility to people or to planet. Then within 10 years, there was such an explosion of undue influence, economic, financial influence from these major corporate forces on our government that our government divorced from its, from its ethical center. I mean, there are public policies in this country that show no ethical or moral concern for people or for planet. What's their excuse? Oh, but it helps corporations because that helps the economy and then that'll help people. And really what it does is help a very, very small group of people. So what we need to remember is that first principle in the United States, which is what we want to take, that we want to take care of individual freedom and we want to take care of the common good. So what we need in this country, I believe, is capitalism with a conscience. And of course, there are socialist elements as well as capitalist elements to an evolved society. But how can we talk about a vibrant capitalist economy when so many people have no access to capital? Hello? How can you talk about capitalism when the vast majority of your citizens really have no access to real capital? And that's the thing particularly among young people. They just want to get in the game. They just want to become young capitalists and people aren't letting them. That's the reason to me why healthcare should be available to everybody. That's the reason to me why we should get rid of these college loans. That's the reason to me why people should be able to have free higher education. Why? So that they can relax. So that they can be about the business of living their highest, best life so that they're not shackled. It's emotional and, and psychological shackling. That's the thing in the United States for most people, not for everybody, but for most people, it's not a matter of the external chains that bind us, but the internal chains that bind us. If you live all day, every day, worried what's gonna happen, if you have an unexpected expenditure, how can you soar? How can you spread your wings? That is the whole point of the American dream, that anybody should be able to become and to actualize all of their God-given potential. But how do you do that when you're worried about money all the time? How do you do that when you're worried about healthcare all the time? So look at these young people. On one hand, they wanna get an education so that they can become really good at doing that which they need to uh, do in order to pursue their dream. But then they get out of school loaded by such college loan debt that they're afraid if I actually go after my dream, even with the education that I got, which would enable me to do that, I'm not sure that I would be able to pay off these college loans, so they end up doing something else. So they're not particularly happy. They're not happy at work. There's so many people who are in jobs they hate, but they're there for the health, health care benefit, jobs that they hate, but they're there for, to be able to pay, pay off their college loans. So what do you get? You get people like that. You get people who are living like this. In order to have a vibrant society, a happy society, vibrant, happily, happy relationships, families, and an economy, you need to have people who are like happy in the morning. We go to work, we're happy, we wanna do what we wanna do. And that's where you get happy employers, abundant employers, happy employees, abundant employees. All these people say they want it. capitalism, great. That's capitalism, that's what people want. They just want in, let these young people get in. How many of these people, and by the way, many of these people who have these college loan debts, they're, they're boomers. This is people at all age. They would love nothing more than to have $2,500 so that they could start their own website, they wish they did have the discretionary spending so that they could start their project. We're not letting them. And the thing is, the problem in America is not that some people can make money. That's a good thing. The problem is not enough people can make money. If people don't have access to capital, how can they be in a capitalist economy? And I don't think that the average person who makes money in this country wants to feel that they're doing so at the expense of other people having an opportunity. That's economics. That's economics. We need to shift from an economic bottom line to a humanitarian bottom line. I ran on that through my presidential campaign. You might remember that. Because it's important. 
and we must continue with that message, and we must continue to foster it, and we must have an intelligent conversation about all of these things. We must not look away, and we must forge a new pathway forward. Humanity is what matters. Our humanity, we need a humanitarian bottom line. And that will heal and foster all things good, including our economy. So, if anybody says to you when you say these things, oh, you just don't understand economics, this is what you say to them. You want to bet? That's all. You want to bet? That's the economics of the 21st century. What climate change, coronavirus, all these things are showing us now is that humanity will not thrive. Some would say we might not even survive throughout the 21st century until we learn how to do things differently. And it is a spiritual concept that your life begins to change when you consider the possibility there might be another way. We can put people first. All public policy, I believe, should be guided by one question. What will help people thrive? Not what will help the short-term profit of major multinational corporations. That needs to go into the dustbin of history. You know what that did? It took us to where we are. We need to get out of that ditch. We need to go somewhere completely different now. What will help people thrive? That which helps people thrive will also help your economy thrive. That's the new economics. Thanks. See you next time.